In this episode, I'm going to help you set up FS Logix and MSIX app attached storage running on Azure Files with Azure Private Link. Roll the intro. I'm Dean Safola, and this is the Azure Academy. So here's our scenario for today. We've got 5,000 users we need to support in Windows Virtual Desktop, and that's broken down into three different kinds of users that are spread across three regions. Now, the best practice for FS Logix is to have one file share per host pool. And since we have three different regions with three different kinds of users, and we'll have three different host pools, but we need two file shares for FS Logix. We also need to make sure that one third of our users can be online at the same time from each of the individual regions because we have a follow the sun model. And on the security authentication side of things, we are going to be using Azure Private Link to isolate our WVD session host within a region to their own file share so that nobody else can access it. And the authentication piece is going to be handled by Active Directory integration with our Azure Files account, followed by setting up all the Azure Files permissions on that share and the NTFS Windows permissions for least privilege access. And that also means that we're going to have to update our network security groups and our spokes to be able to communicate with private link. So now that you know what's going on today, let's go build us some storage accounts. Now we're going to need users to access our storage account. So I'm just running Azure AD Connect with the Express settings. And this is not normally recommended in a production environment, but since this is just our lab for the AZ140 test, Express is good enough because it'll just sync everything across into Azure. And over here in the Azure portal in the users section, you can see there are all of our users. So Azure AD Connect is working, but we also have groups and they're all called WVD underscore users underscore whatever the region is. And that's so we can have our storage account by private link to the subnet where the host pools are located, isolated to just those user profiles. Okay, so let's just go click on the plus in the top and you can scroll down to the bottom and select storage accounts. We want to choose the WVD resource group first in the East US. Then we have our name for the storage account. Now names and storage accounts can be a little tricky because you can't use any special characters. It's only letters and numbers. And then the next thing to think about is the length of the name. So you can have 24 characters in a storage account normally. However, because we are doing the Active Directory authentication integration for our storage accounts, your name needs to be 15 characters or less because that's a standard Active Directory NetBIOS limitation. So I'm gonna call mine STOR and then put in the region, EUS, and then have something at the end. It could be your alias, or the first part of your email address, or just anything you want. I'm using AZ140. Now, one more thing about storage account names. They need to be globally unique. That means when I create this storage account, your storage account cannot have the same name. Now, we still wanna follow the same naming convention here, so we're all on the same page. So at the end of your storage account, don't use AZ140, use something else. And just be sure, again, that you stay under that 15 character limit. Then we have the particular region selected, East US in this case, and then we have our performance options, and this is either standard or premium. And we also know from our scenario that we need one third of our users to be online at the same time. So one third of 2000 users is about 660 users, and that number times 50 is 33,000. Now with standard, the maximum performance you can get out of a single file share is 10,000 IOPS. So we need to go with premium. When you choose premium, you have your account kind, and you need to select that as file storage. Then for your replication options, you have two choices, locally redundant and zone redundant. In this case, local redundancy is just fine because we're going to be using cloud cache to replicate our storage between our different regions. So let's hit next for our networks. Here in the networking section, you can see we've got three different options up top. And by default, all storage accounts are accessible from the internet, and that's what's included with all networks. Now that doesn't mean that your data is out there and exposed to the internet. We still have things like SAS tokens to secure our storage accounts, but it has to do with where the endpoint is that the clients communicate with. When it's set for public endpoint, that means that there is a IP address out there on the public internet that your storage account will respond to. If you choose the middle option, that would be public endpoints from inside selected networks 
where you want to isolate it to on-prem or to Azure virtual networks. But that's not good enough in this case, because we don't want just any old VNet to be able to access our storage. We want only one specific subnet to be able to get there. So we need the private endpoint. And when we do that, we've got a new section here that we've got to fill out. So over there on the left, click add, and then you get this blade here that we need to fill out, starting with their subscription and resource group. This should be, of course, for our WBD spoke in the East US location, and then our name. I'm gonna use PRIV and then put in the abbreviation for the region EUS, and then end it with AZ140, just so I know that it's related to this storage account. The storage subsystem in this case, your only option is file because this is a premium account. And then we have our network. Now for the network, we want this to be our spoke WVD network since we want that to be isolated to our session hosts in the EUS. Then we have the private DNS configuration at the bottom. This is going to help your systems be able to locate the storage account and we definitely want to use that in our solution. So go ahead and hit OK at the bottom. So let's hit Next for data protection. Now the only thing here that relates to Azure file storage is soft delete. All the rest of these things here are for blob storage. Now soft delete is enabled by default on your file shares, and I'll show you how you can disable it if you want to, since this is just our lab. But if you wanted to enable it, you just check the box and then tell it how many days you want to retain data after you've deleted it. And of course soft delete is so that you can recover it without having to go to your Azure backups. We don't need to make any changes here on the advanced screen, so hit next and add your tags. And these are just the standard tags I've used throughout this series. And that would be the application, the environment, the owner, and most importantly, the cost center. And when you're ready, go ahead and create. Now, I'm not going to walk you through provisioning the other two storage accounts. It's the same process, just with different names. So pause the video if you need to. Go ahead and get that done. And then when you're ready, I'll meet you in your storage account. Okay, so my stuff is finished. There's my three storage accounts, each one in their appropriate region. So let's click on East US, and you can see the only service that's available here is file storage. That's because it's a premium files account. Now over on the left, you can click on networking, and at the top, you'll see it's selected networks has been chosen, but there are no networks actually picked. Let's switch over to the private endpoints configuration tab, and that's where you'll find your private link instance, and it is set to auto approve. Now go ahead and click right over here where it has the private endpoint, and that'll take us over here to the private link blade. Starting at the top, we've got our virtual network, which shows our WVD spoke, and then we have a network interface. So the way private link works is you actually get a Azure network card, and that card has an IP address that represents the service, Azure files in this case, inside your virtual network. That's how we're gonna write our NSG rules in a few minutes. Then over on the left, we have the DNS configuration. And this is that Azure private DNS zone that we set up in the process. And that shows that we've got a fully qualified domain name for our Azure files representation, as well as a private IP address. And one last thing, if you go to the search at the top, we want to do a lookup private DNS zones and just click that, then you should have at least one instance of an Azure private zone, and that should be located in our network resource group. And here you can see all of our private DNS records for the East US, Japan, and UK. And then what makes the magic happen is over there on the left, the virtual network link. And this is where that private DNS zone gets registered with the individual Azure virtual networks in our hub and our spokes. So this way we'll be able to use one private DNS account for all of this information. Now remember I told you before that soft delete is enabled by default and up here in the middle, you can change that. And when you click on it, you'll get this blade here and you can just disable by flipping the toggle right there and then just hit save at the bottom. So the next thing to do is create a file share. So go ahead and hit the plus file share at the top. And when you do, you'll get this blade here at the side. Give your file share a name. To keep them all consistent, I'll use share, then the region of EUS, and then AZ140, so I know that it's related to this same storage account. 
And then we have the size of the share. Now size in premium is directly tied to performance. So I've chosen a 10 terabyte share. So the baseline IO when we do 10 terabytes is around 10,000. And that's great because that's my steady state number. But when I have all those log in log offs, I'll be using this burstable number that goes up to 30,000. So I should be fine. When you've got that set up, hit create at the bottom. Now just one more thing to keep in mind is that premium storage accounts bill based on on the size of the file share. So the clock is now ticking. Now because these file shares can be dynamic, what you may want to do is adjust the size of the share smaller so that you would be billed less until you're ready to start ramping things up with all of your users. And you can do that just by clicking the three dots over here and then clicking chain size and performance. And the smallest size that we can create here is 100 gigabytes. And so that's what I'll set mine to because I'm going through this as a video process for all of you. So that way I don't burn all of my Azure credits. And then just hit update at the bottom. And our size has been updated. Just be sure that you put it back to the right size before you start onboarding your users. Now that we have a share, we need to get authentication going. So go ahead and click the link over there where it says Active Directory Not Configured. Now at the bottom of that screen, you'll see Identity Based access for file shares and it calls out Azure Active Directory domain services and there's just a button to go ahead and easily enable that. Do not click that button. We're not using Azure AD domain services in this case, we're using a regular domain controller. So what you need is the link at the very bottom how to domain join this storage account. And that'll open up a link over here on the side that's actually the Azure Doc. And you can click the link up here at the top and that'll just expand it out into a new window and make it a little more readable. And what you'll want to do is click on this link for part one and you're going to scroll down just a little bit to this download AZ files hybrid module. Now we're going to access our domain controllers over Azure Bastion. So go ahead and copy that link. Then back in the Azure portal, go find your domain controller that's in East US and then hit the connect button at the top. From there, you'll want to click on Bastion and then click on the use Bastion button. And because we're logging on to a domain controller, provide the appropriate credentials and then hit connect. Now when you do, a new tab will open, you'll be logged on and pick up right where you left off. Once again, browsing the internet from a domain controller is not a best practice, but because this is our lab and we don't have an administrative server, we're doing it from here. But anyway, go ahead and click the link right over there and download the zip file. And once that's finished, go ahead and extract all the contents. And then you want to copy the path where all of these files are and go into PowerShell. And to make things easy for yourself, go ahead and switch directories to wherever that was. And you should see that you've got three files in there. Then flip back to the Azure Docs and scroll down just a bit until you find this very large PowerShell block and then copy all of that code. And just paste that back here into PowerShell and we've just got a couple quick edits to make. So I've added my subscription ID, resource group name, and the name of the storage account. And we'll just scroll down a little bit. You can see that we're referencing those as variables. And then we have this domain account type. And I've chosen to use a computer account here instead of a service account. The next line is optional. And this is for specifying an OU to create the computer object in. And same thing with encryption type. This is optional as well. This determines how Kerberos auth is done. I'll leave those up to you. I'm actually going to delete both of them because in this lab, it doesn't matter. So go ahead and highlight lines one through 30 and then just execute that code. And when you do, you'll see this warning that we are changing the execution policy in order to run this particular script. That's okay to do because one, this is our lab and two, after this PowerShell session closes, the policy will go back to normal. So go ahead and hit yes to all and then the files will be copied to the appropriate places and you'll be asked to sign in to Azure. And after that, it'll run the script to join your storage account, which will just take a moment. So that looks like a good output. So if you go back to the Azure storage account and then in the configuration section of the blade at the bottom, we've now got two different identity based options. Azure AD domain services, which is now grayed out. And then under that active directory domain services, which is now enabled showing which domain we are joined to. And just to verify everything, go to the file share and at the top, it now says Active Directory is configured. So it all looks good. Now we need to assign the permissions. 
And there's two layers to this, Azure Files and Windows NTFS. Now, because of how Azure AD Connect functions, your domain admin account that you're logged in with will not sync over to Azure. That's just a security feature in Azure AD Connect. So to get around this for our storage account permissions, we're gonna take Adam Warlock and give him the rights of domain admin, and then we can finish the rest of this back in the Azure file share. Go over there to access control. Then at the top, we wanna to click the add button and then select add role assignment. When you do, you'll get this pop out here and you wanna choose your role at the top and scroll all the way down until we find the storage file data SMB share elevated contributor. Then you'll need to select your user that you want to have those elevated contributor rights. Now in this case, I'm gonna choose Adam Warlock, then go ahead and add another role assignment. This time we want the share contributor. And because this is the East US, go ahead and search for that WBD Users USA group. And when you're done, you should have two different permissions assigned. Now it's the elevated contributor that will have the rights to set the NTFS permissions. But in order to do that, we have to map our drive first. So at the bottom on the left, let's go back to our file share. Then you wanna click those three dots again, and this time select connect and if all goes well the authentication method should be active directory and you'll have a box of code right here go ahead and copy that and then we want to go back to our domain controller in the azure portal and then in the bastion connect settings go ahead and log in with adam warlock and just open your powershell ise again and paste in your code and then go ahead and run it. And that'll just take a quick second to run and you should have a new Z drive map. So right click on that and go to properties and then go to the security tab and click edit. Now you should see that Adam Warlock is already here and he's got special permissions. That's what that elevated contributor role did for us. But now go ahead and click add. And when you do, you'll be able to search for the right thing that you need. In this case, we're looking for WVD users groups and you want the one for USA. And when you've added that, just hit OK, and you'll get this warning about setting permissions, and yes, we want to continue. Now that you've added the group, click on Advanced, and you want to set the creator owner rights to have access of modify, applying to subfolders and files only. Adam Warlock is our administrator, so he should have full control over this file, subfolders and files. And finally, the WVD Users USA group should have modify access on this folder only. And that sets up the least privilege access rights according to the FSLogix docs, which are linked in the description below. And the last piece of the puzzle are our network security groups in the spokes. So we've created here rule 180, and that's to allow SMB outbound, and that's on port 445 on the TCP protocol from the virtual network, which would be the spoke, to a specific IP address, and that's the one of our private link, 10.1.0.4 for the East US. Now I've got some homework for you, so don't run away on me just yet. We need to set up the other two storage accounts in Japan and UK, and we need to create the file shares and private link and all of that stuff. Keep in mind though that in Japan, we will not be using FSLogix, but we will be using MSIX App Attach. So be sure to create that in Japan, UK, and in US and repeat all of these processes. So you go and complete that homework so you're ready for the next episode. Speaking of which, we'll next be getting into making our images for our session host so that we're ready to deploy our host pools. And all this stuff is in the AZ140 study guide series right here at the bottom. And you can always catch the latest Azure Academy video at the top. Thanks for joining me today, and I will catch you in our next episode. Happy learning.